joining us here in the Aula Magna at IE School of Architecture and Design, IE University. Thanks for joining us online, those who are following us in streaming. It's a pleasure for me to be here. My name is Martha Thorne. I'm Dean at IE School of Architecture and Design. And every year to participate in the Hay Festival is a real honor and a pleasure. And it's a pleasure basically because we have such uh, interesting and varied participants. And this year we have two women in the field of architecture and design who will be with us. The first, Stephanie Chaltiel. She is one of the founders of MUD Architects. And MUD, M-U-D-D, -D, because D for MUD, M-U-D for MUD, the, of course, the earth um, that we all inhabit, and the MUD, the material. But the second D is because of digital. It's a very unique firm that combines craft, very humble materials, and technology. Let me tell you just a little bit about Stephanie because she can then tell you about the work of the firm and we'll have the conversation, especially about vertical gardens, sustainability, and the possibilities of technology for building sustainable constructions in the future. Uh, Stephanie is a French architect and as I mentioned, co-founder with three other people of MUD Architects and they have an office in Barcelona, another one in Dubai, and they have a third of their four partners in C Seattle. In Vancouver. Vancouver, excuse me, Vancouver, <laughs> Canada. Um, she studied architecture in Grenoble, in Madrid, and in Mexico, and was always interested in extreme habitats such as the tropics, and how these can be made more sustainable for future generations. Before founding Mud Architects uh, a little more than a year ago, she worked at other major firms throughout the world. Uh, she had a time with Bernard Schumi in New York, OMA, the office founded by Rem Koolhaas, and also Zaha Hadid Architects in London. Now, even though the firm is only one year old, they have already won many awards, um, such as in 2019 from the publication and blog DZine, uh, Icon Design, about 100 talented young firms. And I think the most outstanding one is the 2020 FASTCO World Changing Ideas Awards. So the thing about Stephanie is the innovation, the power of research and design to change the world. Not only does she practice, but has taught in Singapore, London, uh, and also in Barcelona. I won't go on anymore, Stephanie, I could, but please share with us a little bit about the projects and the focus of your firm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marta, for the very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I want to say that I'm really happy to be here today as well. It's one of the first events that we can do uh, presential since uh, the pandemic. And so I'm very excited to be here with you tonight. Um, so as Martha said, we uh, started putting together uh, technologies that combine robotics uh, with natural, raw, and local materials. Um, so that's, I don't know if you can see the image. Yeah, so uh, that, uh, that was the very first uh, little prototype we did uh, where the technologies uh, that actually were technologies that already existed but in other fields were put together into architecture. So the idea that we have here and that we keep on developing is to have a kind of shotcrete. So shotcrete is the projection of a material, of a mortar onto a support. Uh, to be done uh, by drone instead of having it done by hand, by scaffoldings. The reason why we are investigating in this uh, is really to bring down the cost and to offer quality uh, and higher sustainability in terms of material to a higher number. Um, 
so I'm going to show you a few little videos so that it looks a little bit more real. Um, at first, you know, when we started combining those technologies, a lot of people thought we were crazy. <laughs> uh, it's like, why do you use a drone to spray mud? Um, and then slowly, I have to say that uh, we started uh, in 2016. I started alone because I had um, a European funding to uh, support me in those technologies. Um, and in between 2016 and now, uh, now a lot of people are approaching us and say, we need these technologies to do this. We understand uh, why uh, the fact that you can bring such light equipment on site, even if the site is remote, um, using local raw material, we understand. And as well for paint, for example, for finishing. So this was... Um, uh, a project we did recently, uh, just before the pandemic in Brussels. Um, so, of course, uh, as you can imagine, we really work with a highly multidisciplinary team. That's really the key uh, to manage this kind of crazy projects. Uh, so the, the, the drone team is from Belgium, and we work with artificial intelligence specialists uh, in order to automate the flights of the drone to be able to spray at the right places. Uh, and then we are mud architects, so we are more on the design side. But really, we all work together for example, the drone pilots might help in the architecture. The IE specialist is going to give his or her opinion on the mortar composition. So everyone starts to mingle their skills towards the same objective. And um, as you can see a bit in those images, uh, the idea is to reach high or high to access, difficult to access, variable geometry, little corners that, ha that are high up. And you know, sometimes uh, constructions, um, if they are complex geometries, the scaffolding may end up being just as expensive as the construction itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea of using the drone uh, to spray the mortar, but as well to spray the seeds, as I will introduce quickly today, uh, for vertical gardens, uh, is as well to go faster and cheaper, to say it very <laughs> roughly. So this image is from a hotel in London that is one of the... Um, biggest vertical garden in Europe. Of course, you have the one in Madrid that is very beautiful by uh, uh, Foundation Keisha. Um, so as you see, those people need to really uh, plant and manicure and uh, take care of the vegetation growing by hand. They need to climb, and it's a highly skilled job. It's dangerous. Um, of course, that's great, and only in really um, emblematic uh, buildings such as those luxury hotels or this really uh, the, the, the museum but uh, what we would like to investigate and what we have started developing with a team of gardeners and designers who are more involved in vegetation is to bring those vertical gardens or those green urban uh, pop-up almost uh, spaces um, so that we don't need to have such a huge budget and such, uh, and such permanency as well. We don't need them to stay there forever. Um, so we're also particularly interested, I'm sure we will talk with Martha about this, uh, about the fact that the vegetation doesn't need to be entirely manicured, but as well to leave the space and to just give the impetus so that um, spontaneous vegetation can then grow and give the impression to citizens that they just made a discovery of this place that just happened, as opposed to being so uh, manicured and planned. So this is a suggestion that we made for Singapore for new housing, uh, where you can see citizens that could access directly from their garden, from uh, their balcony, sorry, the vegetation. Uh, and, and the idea really of, of, of uh, manicuring the, the in-between, so underneath the bridges, uh, that gives the opportunity for new exciting architectures as well. Uh, so the image on the right is from Svenja Kuhn, uh, with who we have uh, just started collaborating as well. And she did some amazing experiments about growing the vegetation directly on the textile. Uh, and this is just a few slides to show you a bit how we work. So we really consider the vegetation as a, uh, a material, and we look at the plant morphology, uh, their color, uh, their, their, their rate of growth, uh, 
uh, and their nutri the nutrient requirements, and between many other factors. So there's really about para almost parametrizing uh, this vivid material, and this is um, a competition that we just did together with Air Lab Singapore uh, to show how we could create pop-up as well, uh, vertical gardens, or just green spaces around uh, existing flats in our cities. So I think perhaps now we could discuss uh, with Martha and with you, hopefully, the, those different points. Great. Stephanie, oh, thank you very much for those images. I, I think reading about you and speaking and seeing the images, the, the things that impress me so much is this disparate ideas are brought together or things we think commonly of a, in a certain way, you challenge them. So maybe we can start first. I wanted to ask a little bit about the firm, and then let's dive into uh, vertical gardens and then go on to technology. But the first question is, Mud Architects uses research as well as projects. It's very hard to be a research-based firm because you need to be, uh, have clients who support that or you need to be able to devote the time and resources to that. On the other hand, the ideas that you're putting forward probably cannot be achieved unless you do the research. So how have, what is your formula? How, have you, how are you able to combine research and projects and is this something that you think you'll be able to, to continue in the future? Yeah, absolutely, Martha. I mean, uh, this is really one of our main challenges, is to continue uh, researching, evolving, because those technologies that we have started developing need really to evolve constantly. Um, there's always like progress in those disciplines and, uh, and, and there's always opportunity to uh, improve what we are proposing to the clients. But we do need to survive. Uh, we do need to make money at this stage uh, and we do need clients to be interested in our techniques. Mm -hmm. So the typical clients so far that were interested in us are for finishing, for example, large scale finishing, large uh, freeform roofing, that is as well uh, something that really interest people. Uh, so the way we work is at MUD, uh, we are a, a collective, let's say, and we all work in different cities in the world. Uh, and we are all connected to certain universities. Uh, so for example, we are connected to Lille Centrale, uh, particularly on the, I, uh, on the artificial intelligence development. We are connected to BCIT, uh, the, the British Columbia in Vancouver with our colleague uh, Maite Bravo. Uh, we are related to Harriet Watt uh, with Mohamed Chamil, who is as well one of the MUD uh, founders. Uh, and then we started as well some uh, discussions in Barcelona at uh, UPC. So it's really a mix between um, finding the right lab that is part of bigger universities that are happy uh, to support us and helping us and teaming with us really officially to develop those technologies. And in parallel, mostly from Barcelona, uh, we are applying those technologies into uh, projects, into commercial projects. Um, and if the commercial projects uh, requires a certain uh, level of uh, uncertainty because we haven't tried it yet, we will try to make it very clear that we have this budget uh, from, let's say, the university or the client is happy to put 20% into our time to investigate something mm -hmm. we haven't done before. So in other words, you fi try to find clients who want to take a risk along with you. Absolutely. Great, fantastic. <laughs> um, Stephanie, tell me something uh, about vertical gardens, because uh, as we mentioned, near Kaisha Form is a beautiful garden, but not all that's gold, or not all that glitters is gold. Um, so from your point of view, and probably also from the point of view of public, the public, we should have a critical eye when we're hearing about ideas or looking at them. 
Now, the, the garden by Kaisha Form, you mentioned, it, of course, it's high and they need labor to go up and, and deal with it. They don't use drones. The other problem that we talked about is that it has PVC, in other words, a shield between the vertical garden and the building. So um, the benefit of reducing the carbon footprint by having plants is somehow offset by the having to use PVC, which is a very uh, unsustainable material. The other problem I, that you mentioned to me is that it needs to, it doesn't recycle water. It needs to use drinking water. So there seem to be some issues where I believe that you're trying to innovate and evolve. So could you tell us a little bit about the vertical gardens you work on? What are the priorities? What, what are you trying to achieve in them and why? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, uh, those existing vertical gardens are absolutely stunning. They are, they are usually a piece of art. Uh, Patrick Blanc, who is the botanist and gardener who did uh, the Kaisha Forum, one and many other ones around the world, um, really treats the vegetal uh, as a painter. Is, uh, uh, it is quite fascinating. Uh, but where we, what we are uh, from Mud trying to look at uh, is, um, is the sustainability of the building itself. So what we are trying to do is instead of uh, adding an additional structure with a PVC and then the double felt uh, with the plants, we are trying to get the substance, the, the flesh of the, of the walls themselves in the mortar to uh, have the seeds inside. Uh, so uh, we are trying to uh, interpret and use technologies that are well developed in the agriculture, in the precision agriculture world already. Um, and we are working with Un Jardin sur le Toit. They are gardeners uh, from Lille in France uh, to, uh, to project the mortar with the seeds directly embedded uh, in it. But because the projection is strong, we need to protect the seeds when they are projected. So there's a, a, a temporary bubble. Uh, is a little uh, ball that is around the seed that protects it temporarily until it starts to grow its roots and its leaves. Uh, that's one important aspect. And then, as you were mentioning, Martha, the, um, the water. Uh, so at the moment, a lot of uh, existing vertical gardens are connected to the tap, to normal tap water that everyone uh, can drink. Uh, so we are also trying to see the circuit, what is uh, the path of the water to be able to collect the rainwater or recycle uh, used water. Uh, which we can do easily with small drones to spray, then to go and collect the water from the rain or that are recycled and go and spray them where they are needed onto the vertical wall or roof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the vertical gardens, is this um, uh, with a look towards reducing the carbon footprint, um, having more cleaner air in the city, or is there an aspect of psychological well-being what, how do you balance those in your work? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, um, of course, the green and the, the vertical gardens uh, absorb CO2. So the more we have them in our cities, uh, of course, we, we, we may well uh, improve the quality of the air. Uh, but more importantly as well is about the dwellers, the citizens that live in those buildings that may have those uh, vertical gardens. So it, it is for this reason as well that we are trying to have um, a system that leaves uh, the air to go through as opposed to have the PVC that would block the air. Uh, in that regard, we would really improve uh, the, the indoors comfort in terms of climate and provide hopefully long-term uh, savings in terms of energy simply because uh, the thickness of the wall with the vegetation is going to absorb the heat from, uh, uh, from the sun and makes it cooler in summer and vice versa in winter. Um, so that's one aspect. And then during the pandemic and the confinement, uh, I think we all heard and ourselves <laughs> uh, that we are desperately uh, eager to find more green spaces. Uh, and in that regard, a lot of people live in flats. Uh, some, some don't even have uh, a balcony. Uh, and I read so many comments on social media, like my dream is to lay down on the grass and dream. And you know, like, the, the green is an aspect that is undeniably uh, helping mental health 
and well-being mm -hmm. uh, all together. So we really believe to offer it even in a format that is not so permanent as a vertical garden, but a pop-up green space, a bit like the last image I showed, uh, could really improve uh, life in the cities. Mm -hmm. Um, a question, using drones to water vertical gardens, using drones, as you showed, uh, for construction, have you had any problems? Have, have, uh, have you had difficulty with uh, traffic, uh, police saying you can't be flying these? How do you, how do you manage those day-to-day -day mundane problems? Yeah, that's a really good question, Martha, <laughs> because this is one of the big problems with the drones in cities. Um, so that's the reason why we as well did that project in Brussels, that wall that was just, um, it was just earth and paint, it was clay paint. Um, so we found out uh, by talking with hundreds of people <laughs> in the aviation departments that somehow um, if we work behind netted, just simple net, we are allowed, at least in Europe, uh, to work uh, with a drone anywhere. Uh, so basically we just have two cherry pickers that lift up the net and behind the net we are allowed uh, to work with the drones. Good idea. Mm -hmm. One other question that you showed uh, that came up when I saw the images, um, different types of plants. Do you also try to reestablish biodiversity in the city? Is that do you get into that um, agriculture, botany, so, so closely defined as to uh, increasing or protecting plant species? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the, we, we are really influenced by uh, Roberto Bole Marx, uh, who, the amazing uh, work and landscapes that he did. Um, uh, in Argentina and in Brazil, uh, where he was famous to go out in the forest, in the tropical forest, with his team to collect species. Uh, and it was quite daring to do this, because usually you just go to the plant shop and see what is available. But he uh, used to go there with his team in the forest and find uh, autochthone species and manage to make them grow in the cities. Of course, uh, those tropical plants in forest, uh, they need uh, to have specific environments to be thriving if you replant them in another uh, environment. Um, but this leads as well to think about uh, the wildlife, of course, any new species that we're going to, uh, plant species that we're going to introduce in our cities. Uh, of course, how, as we know, like uh, the, the minor change could bring huge changes in terms of uh, animals. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of attention to um, the importance of bees in the city. And so I can imagine vertical gardens, um, even the ones that you've mentioned that many individual clients, small uh, families, individuals are asking for small interventions. Um, do you see people making a do-it-yourself uh, um, effort for, for vertical gardens, or do you think that still professionals such as yourself are necessary? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, there are two main techniques we could say as well, is really uh, building the vertical wall or is just planting next to a wall and then uh, having the climbing plant and then uh, guiding slightly that climbing plant on the wall. And the climbing plants are much easier to put in place, and I guess uh, we all know those Mediterranean uh, houses that are invaded by the, by the vegetation, yeah. and yeah. that personally I love. <laughs> uh, so, but I think the vertical gardens uh, themselves that are really built, even if uh, they deal with continuous uh, vegetation, are hard to put in place in the first mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. Let, let's move on to technology. Um, uh, how did you become interested in technology? Is it something natural that you studied because of the uh, generation or the subjects in, at the university? Has it been a, a love affair that you came upon some way? Or was it perhaps a, an insurmountable problem that you were faced with and you had to look to technology to, to solve it for you? I'm, I'm really curious because um, some of the ideas that we've talked about and seen are, are very much uh, using the human hand, taking into account uh, natural materials, the passage of time, plants, 
and technology seems to be such a counterpoint to this. So how did this all start? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, my entrance into this kind of projects is really from the hands-on, from uh, building by hand, so the, the, the first uh, part of my career, let's say, was really uh, to build with bird and to build with natural uh, materials, and this is la really laborious tasks that require to um, to repeat the same action many times, or that involves risks that therefore not everyone can do, limited to women as well. Um, so just uh, very naturally, I uh, started to be interested in new technologies. Um, and I started to notice that they had many points in common. For example, uh, earth architecture, uh, or of course, vertical gardens, has a very playful aspect to them. Mm. And so do drones and robots, and why not to make them work together? Um, but as well, I think something important to say is that um, uh, by facilitating, by easing some of those most laborious tasks, we are aiming to leave more time to highly skilled manual crafts that usually we don't have time on site or money. Mm -hmm. Tell me something, um, uh, thinking about other architects, designers, um, Anna Herringer, who has uh, been with us in the past, she often spoke about architecture, especially working in remote places or developing nations, as a source of employment. If you're using technology and drones, are you destroying employment? Or how do you see employment and, and architecture working together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the main um, uh, challenges that we uh, uh, started with MUD as well was the idea of the dweller to be involved in uh, his or her uh, environment or habitat, whatever it is, even the refurbishment of a flat. I'm not talking necessarily about a hut. Um, and we are, we are thinking that by easing, again, some of the tasks that are difficult, that needs highly skilled uh, constructors, let's say, then it leaves more time to, for people to be more involved, for example, in the finishing, uh, in the aspect that their walls will get. Um, there's a very tactile uh, aspect to the work we're doing. And for example, you know, vertical garden, as um, Jean-Bernard Wesselin, who is a gardener with who we work, uh, always mentions that uh, few people lay, uh, bend down and touch the ground to touch the, the, the vegetation, but in vertical gardens, everyone starts to do this and caress that wall. So there's really the two aspects, and the technology to ease what we wouldn't be able to do ourselves, and the highly tactile and craft that we are trying to actually preserve or even reintroduce. And uh, in terms of technology, uh, any surprise that you've come across that you were thinking of using drones for something or maybe uh, some sort of technology uh, for a specific project and the result was totally different than what you expected? Yeah, uh, I mean, a lot of the projects that we did so far since we created MUD uh, one year ago are uh, public installations to kind of raise the awareness of those new technologies to a large public who are not architects or constructors. Mm -hmm. Um, and for those uh, events, for example, the Milan Design Week, uh, the, the Design Junction in London, so we built in very city centers of those, uh, of those very big cities, and it's obviously not easy for all the authorizations it requires. Um, so, so we have very few days to build those prototypes each time, four or five days I'm talking about. And like the, the, the vault that we did for the polit for Isola Design District, there was a commission from Regione Lombardia politicians uh, in Milan, was in five days and there were three vaults uh, of eight meters tall. Uh, so we need to improvise a lot on site. <laughs> and uh, those improvisations, uh, it's kind of a really condensed version, and then it gives us a huge ground to explore for the quite more quiet time of investigation afterwards. And during Milan, we found out that because we're using fabric as formwork to spray on it, we, we found out that using the drone to carry the, the, the fabric over uh, the arches is very convenient, and especially if we are thinking about scaling up 
those technologies that mm -hmm. we can use the drones like little birds really uh, bringing the fabric on top of the arches and then spraying. So would it be fair to say that um, uh, when you're using technology, it's always because it's safer, because it um, is more efficient, but not efficient in terms of let's do it quickly and make more money. It's more efficient because then you can use um, people's handcrafts for what people really can contribute to a project rather than just the routine or the dangerous. Is, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. I guess we always have a very pragmatical approach. In a way, um, there's a kind of um, uh, an irony uh, between the fact that the drone spray and the other technologies that we're trying to put in place look, uh, you know, a little bit like crazy scientists, but at the same time, it comes from very practical considerations. What about when you look to the future, Stephanie? Um, will we see change in the construction industry? I mean, still, the projects that you work on are very specific um, and smaller scale. I'm sure there will be large scale coming in the future, but they're, they're quite unique projects um, that need a special client, need a, a, a special place. But what about the mainstream? Do you see changes in mainstream? Do you see MUD becoming involved in more mainstream projects? And are you optimistic about the use of technology? So look into your crystal ball and tell us where you think things are going. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess uh, we all need uh, politics to help us as well in launching uh, new technologies because no matter how good are the ideas, how good are the teams, how well the technologies already work, if there's not a, a little push, let's say, from uh, the politicians to at least um, encourage, let's say, developers to choose certain technologies over others, uh, and take a certain level of risk, of course, any change, any innovation always comes with criticism and risks um, to help us launching those uh, technologies. But I have to say that just before the pandemic, uh, we did have uh, large uh, projects coming up, like for example, the 10,000 meter squares uh, painting, so a lot for finishing again very practical aspects. <laughs> I think people start to realize that it actually it might be faster and cheaper to use this kind of technologies for very down-to-earth mm -hmm. uh, jobs, such as the paint. Mm -hmm. um, I know at one point they, uh, it was talked about that everyone would have a 3D printer at their home, and that certainly hasn't happened. <laughs> Um, do you think everyone is going to have a drone in their, uh, at their doorstep or, or will, again, the technology be uh, in the domain of certain people or certain professionals? Yeah, uh, so that's a really interesting question because uh, we need to differentiate um, the drone spray that we are using for either heavy construction such as a mortar, the short crit, uh, this is really the, the, you know, the structure of the building. Uh, as opposed to manicuring and, sp and, and, and spraying the seeds. Uh, for manicuring, for spraying water, fertilizers, nutrients, we only need very small drones that can be uh, flown by anybody that has, you know, two weeks training. And so this could be totally uh, imaginable that people would use them just to manicure their five meters tall uh, green wall. Why not? But the other one that is more for uh, heavy mortar and construction, uh, it's really highly skilled jobs. It's, it's pretty much uh, it's the same as a pilot for, uh, for, for planes. It's the same training. Uh, but more and more, it can be all flown remotely. So in the, in the case of the pandemic as well, we could imagine that those technologies could well develop if we can't go on site because it can right. be flown remotely. Uh, and what we are particularly working on in terms of research and innovation with the different academic clubs that we are linked with uh, is the automated flights. So automated flights, it means that uh, we don't need the highly skilled pilot to be there on site. We need someone who can deal with the automated flight. So we can press a button to land in emergency, let's say. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't need to fly it. Mm -hmm. 
Could we just go back? Uh, we have a few more minutes. Could we go back to this idea of multidisciplinary? Uh, because you mentioned that you, in, in your team, um, you work with uh, specialists in different fields. Is that a way of the future? And could you tell us a little bit about the positive or negative aspects of trying to create this multidisciplinary team? Again, this is one of the things that when we look at society, there's one tendency to be very specialized, to do one thing, uh, and then on the other side, there is much more coming together, breaking down of silos and trying to form uh, groups that see a problem from different perspectives. So could you tell us a little bit about um, the way you approach multidisciplinary teams, um, is everyone equal, are there difficulties, and um, then extrapolate. Do you think this is something that we will see more of in other professions, other fields? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have to say it is not easy uh, to find the right professional. Uh, many times it's been kind of a really long shot. Uh, and uh, it was really un I was really unsure uh, whether I was approaching the right professional, whether that professional would be too expensive, not interested enough to give some free time, because at the end of the day, all those projects, we've been doing it with people who were so passionate about it that they've been working with us for free. That's an important mm -hmm. aspect. We all worked for free a lot to, to put these technologies into place. Um, and once the team is, is created and then we start to have uh, enough budget to pay everyone uh, equally, um, I can't see any inconvenient. Once really the team is solidary, we feel that everyone is uh, so involved in the same direction and we have found a way of communicating between each other uh, that is a common language. Uh, it is really thrilling, I have to say, and I really can't see any uh, disadvantage of that multidisciplinary uh, work. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not easy to find the right team. Do you always work with the same people, or do you bring in new people for different projects? Uh, well, we, we tend to be very, um, how to say, uh, we always work with the same people. Uh, since since uh, we started in 2015, 2016, has been uh, the same team, and then we add a few new specialists when we need them. For example, with artificial intelligence, that is such a new domain, um, we uh, always bring new specialists in this, mm -hmm. particularly. Great. Stephanie, we've been talking about things that, from a very sort of pragmatic point of view, very functional point of view, what about um, the inspiration for your projects? Because in, in all architecture and design, there's a rich history of other ideas, other people who have come before, uh, observation of places that, that give inspiration. Uh, architecture and design is not just a functional response, although we've been talking about a lot of that um, today. Where does your inspiration come from? What would you suggest to students, young people? Uh, where would you suggest they look for inspiration? Maybe taking an example from your own career. Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess I, I was lucky enough to travel a lot, uh, work-related from a very young age. Uh, so, for example, my experience in French Guyana uh, we worked with a really young mayor, was the youngest mayor of France, because French Guyana is very far from France, but is France. Um, and he wanted us to renew the Amerindian uh, culture to be found into their, 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 their dwellings. And so we worked with the inhabitants and we learned so many very traditional technologies. Uh, we, worked, uh, we worked by hand a lot. I mean, we did a lot of really uh, heavy work, let's say. Um, and this teaches a lot and it's something that I like personally to, you know, put my hands <laughs> in there. Um, and then I think as an advice really to uh, younger designers and uh, students in architecture, uh, is to be very resilient because uh, and, to, and if you have a good idea to not leave one team telling you you know to stop because you can't please everyone 
and I think it is important to uh, team up with the right persons that are going to really like bring you to the point you want, uh, and and not to to get uh, first, not to be too impatient because it takes time to find those right persons, uh, and to persevere. I think is a lot about the perseverance. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, on another question: urban farms. Switching topics. Um, do you see this as a movement where we'll be farming in cities uh, on plots of land, creating uh, gardens where we grow our own food? What's going to happen in that field? You've talked about vertical, but what about, uh, what about food production? Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, since the pandemic, a lot of people have moved out, more moved out of cities. I personally live in a small village and uh, we've been seeing really the affluence of new families uh, looking for having an outdoor space, having a garden, having a, a bigger house. Uh, and I think people uh, have the call for the land much more since this happened. Uh, so uh, I would imagine that that movement will continue, especially with uh, the increased freedom that we have in, in the sense that not everything needs to be presential. Um, and I think a lot of companies and a lot of disciplines have realized that uh, you don't need necessarily to fly to Shanghai for two days to have that meeting and come back the following day. You can do it online and therefore uh, have more time to cultivate your garden, I guess, back at home. Yeah. I, I think there is also a debate. You, you sound like you're starting to uh, uh, talk about it, the debate that maybe we don't need cities uh, in the future, that we can work more uh, remotely. I, I personally would be enormously sad. I, I'm, I'm an urbanite. Uh, I think that uh, cities bring out the best in us in terms of creativity, innovation, education, new ideas. It's where civilization can progress in many, many ways. Uh, and, and it's also challenging to live together, but it seems so important, uh, especially with the, the, um, the lessons that we're learning about a pandemic. We are all connected. Um, do you see a trend or have you experienced that in colleagues and people saying, oh, I'm going to abandon the city, I'm going to live in the country? Uh, or, or when you look, when you look again in your crystal ball to the future, uh, is it something that you're concerned about, or you look, f you look forward to, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think I entirely uh, agree with you. I also absolutely love cities, uh, and of course they will be there, and we need to like take care of them. Uh, but the fact that they are a bit less, uh, the, the, to decrease a little bit the density. Uh, I see that it could be an advantage as well. And um, the fact that people have a bit more choice about where they want, whether they want to be in the city center or they want to be outside in smaller towns as well, perhaps uh, would help as well making the cities less dense and therefore more enjoyable as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the city would certainly be more enjoyable if we had uh, more uh, greenery in many places, more vertical uh, walls throughout. Uh, because it seems that that is one of the problems of the cities. Uh, it's density uh, during the day or density during the night. And the other hours of the day, it's abandoned or it's more a desert. So um, perhaps that idea of combining and allowing people, as you say, a choice so that there are more areas that are more diverse in the city would be good. Stephanie, I wanted, um, wanted to end. We just have a few minutes, but I wanted to end by, I will say a word and you uh, react to that word. And you can react in one word or, or sentences, whatever you feel like. Um, but if I say to you, um, uh, Ecology and the city. Um, urban forest. <laughs> okay. Um, vertical gardens. Vivid material. Okay. Um, technology. That's a big one. Craft. Mm, Well-being. Green. Um, um, 
mental and physical health, fresh air, mm. the future, human, and the past. Wow. <laughs> Not as good as the future. Okay. I think on that note, Stephanie, um, it's clear that uh, you not only in this conversation, but the work that MUD Architects does and the research that you undertake um, has that underpinning of optimism, of looking to the future, not only because you use technology in a creative way, but um, the idea of looking at uh, a more habitable place, um, plants that will grow, an environment that's healthy and sustainable. Um, to me, it's, it's really an inspiration to, to have that optimism and see you practice it every day. We will be keeping our eye on you in the future and to see what MUD Architects does in terms of natural materials and in terms of the digital. And I know I speak for our audience here and online that we wish you enormous success in everything you do. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Martha. Okay, here we go.